it was using the decay heat steam, which is kind of neat, except, you guessed it, the valves that worked that system required electricity. So even though the pump and the turbine were, would, have, would have gone on for days, when they lost the control of the valves, the RCIC turbine stopped. Okay, next slide. So what does that do? The fuel gets hot. Um, this is up on our website. There's a, a friend of mine. I had a piece of nuclear fuel um, empty that, um, that I was given when I was in the industry. And it's made of a thing called zircaloy. And zircaloy is really unique um, in that it does what Dave said. It, uh, it can spontaneously um, oxidize. Basically, it burns. When, uh, when water is in touch with it at temperatures over 100, uh, over about 2,000 degrees, 1,800, 2,000 degrees. Well, what my friend and I did with a, with a blowtorch was simulate what happens to zircaloy when it gets to that temperature. Now, this is one fuel element, and there were thousands of those fuel elements at that kind of a condition inside units one, two, and three when the cooling stopped. Um, what happens then is the zircaloy gets r really brittle, and it's being heated from the inside. Uh, the pellets that Dave was talking about are inside that piece of metal there. Um, and um, uh, so the, the metal gets brittle, and these pellets then break and fall out. And as Dave said, the centerline temperature of those pellets is easily over 3,000 degrees. The pellets then fell to the bottom of all the reactors. Whether or not it was unit one or two or unit three, they wound up with this molten pile of pellets on the bottom. Well, there's water over top, and that was cool in the top of them, but in the center, the water couldn't get to. And it easily got to 5,000 degrees and began to eat at the metal at the bottom of the nuclear reactor. We know now that all three nuclear reactors, um, this molten blob melted through about eight inches of steel um, because the isolation condenser and the RCIC turbines failed. Now, what does that do? It creates a lot of hydrogen. In addition, so while the blob is going down, you've got all this hydrogen building up. And next slide. Um, this is um, a camera that was mounted. Um, they're units two, three, and four. By the time this picture was taken, unit one had already exploded. Um, and these, these pictures are at one th uh, three hundredths of a second apart. Um, so, uh, so here we go. This is, um, now you'll see on the fourth slide that. That's a, a, a flame front. And um, I, I calculated that the speed at which it grew, I could scale it off the building. Um, I knew the size of the building, and I knew the, the, the duration of the, of the single flame, that that flame front was moving at around 1,000 miles an hour. And what that means, that's called a detonation. When something travels faster than the speed of sound, that's called a detonation. When it travels less than the speed of sound, it's a deflagration. Either one of them are going to hurt you, there's no doubt. But the Challenger explosion technically was a deflagration. And we all know that that was catastrophic. But this is worse because the wave front, um, just basically the, the pressure of the wave and the speed of the wave uh, can do enormous damage. This is a problem on all reactors because no one knows why this happened. Um, hydrogen and oxygen at room pressures shouldn't detonate. I talked to a bunch of chemists and we can't figure out how hydrogen and oxygen could detonate. Uh, it can deflagrate, like the Hindenburg, um, but it shouldn't be able to detonate. And that has major ramifications on containment design. Um, containments are not designed to take a detonation wave um, and it can, it can crack it. I, and I hope the NRC uh, pays attention to that. Okay, the two other, two other things here. Th this side of the wave is straight. And the direction is out and to the, to the south, to, 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 your, to my right. Um, and um, 
Uh, I believe that happened because the, the detonation began in the spent fuel pool, which is on that side of the building. That would provide a wall, which it would move straight up against, but the other wall was weak and it would move out. I think that's evidence of the fact that the detonation occurred in the spent fuel pool. Okay, next slide. So now the gases and the, and the cloud of dust and, and the smoke from the explosion begins to dominate and the, um, and the actual flame front begins to um, be obscured. Uh, it's actually there for quite a few frames, but um, at this point, uh, this thing's on its way. Okay, next slide. Now there are those who say that the perfect sphere might, might mean something. I'm not sure that uh, uh, an explosion like that would, would, would not, why wouldn't it form a perfect sphere? But anyway, it's going up as a sphere. This is not a nuclear bomb. This is a chemical reaction, um, but um, clearly the, the amount of energy in it's pretty enormous. Okay. Next slide. 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 This is over two seconds. This, this happened over two seconds. Next slide. Looks like a little face up there. Next slide. Now, to give you an idea, this is 50 meters. This is 150 feet, the top of the building. So we're talking something that's up at three or 4,000 feet in, in just a couple seconds. And I think the last line. Now, the, the rubble is pieces of the roof, but it's also uh, nuclear fuel. And, and that's what's really frightening about this. They were able to find pieces of nuclear fuel about the size of my pinky. Um, almost nuked myself in the eye there. Um, about the size of my pinky. Uh, over a mile away, between a mile and two miles away. And I calculated again how much energy it would take to throw something like that in air, which would have some air resistance. And even if it was a perfect sphere, which had no, very little air resistance, it still would have had to be thrown at around 1,000 miles an hour, which again it indicates that this was a detonation, not a deflagration. I think the nuclear industry is going to argue to downplay the significance of that, but the difference between a detonation and a deflagration is dramatic in containment design. Okay. Now, while that was dramatic, what was, what, that was not what caused the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, um, to evacuate out to 50 kilometers, 50 miles rather. They were concerned about the spent fuel pool which would have been more catastrophic than that explosion had it ignited. Um, the spent fuel pool in Unit 4 had the entire guts of the nuclear reactor plus five, six, or seven years worth of nuclear fuel in it. Uh, Brookhaven's done a study where if one of the nuclear fuel pools catches fire, it will kill about 180,000 people from, from the cancers of the airborne plutonium. So it was not that dramatic explosion that convinced Chairman Yasko to evacuate the Americans. It was fear of the, uh, what was really the worst case that hasn't happened yet. And that's the Unit 4 fuel pool igniting. Um, and it's important to note now that Fukushima had dry cask storage. And the dry cask wrote it out just fine. So one message for, these are dry, typical dry casks, there's different designs, but these are dry casks. They were, were hit by the tsunami, they got wet, they got muddy, but they didn't melt and they didn't explode and they're still there today, essentially intact. Um, the, the lesson here for, for both C-10 and Pilgrim Watch is to get as much of the nuclear fuel out of the fuel pools and into dry cast storage where they're much safer. Okay, Dave, I think you're up. I want to talk a little bit about the primary cause of the disaster at Fukushima. This illustration shows a pressurized water reactor like Seabrook. That was intentional because really, no matter what U.S. reactor was faced with, that, with the primary cause of the disaster, the outcome would basically be the same. The timeline might be different, the pathway might be different, but the destination would have been the same. 
The primary cause was an extended loss of power at a power plant, as ironic as that might be. When the earthquake occurred, the, the normal grid was, was lost, and the plant's own in-plant power from the generator was also lost because, as a result of the earthquake. So the earthquake gave the plant its first strike. It lost its normal supply of the power for the plant. There are backups to that. Each reactor had two emergency diesel generators at the site installed there for the primary purpose or the sole purpose, not prime, of providing electricity to important plant equipment if the normal source of power was lost. Within six seconds or so, six, ten seconds, the emergency diesel generator started and were providing that job of providing electricity to important plant equipment. Not everything, but enough to cool the reactor core and maintain the containment integrity. Then the tsunami arrived. In Japan, they put the emergency diesel generators in the basement of the turbine building. That provided maximum protection against earthquake because if you put something heavy up on stilts and then shake it, it falls. But if you put it down low and shake it, it stays there. So it was maximum protection against the earthquake. They survived the earthquake, but it's not real good protection against floods. And none of them, well, one of them survived. One of the 12 survived the tsunami waves. So the tsunami came in and wiped out the emergency diesel generators to give the plant its second strike. There's a backup to the backup. This plant, as almost all U.S. plants have, were banks of batteries that provide enough power for one safety system per reactor. In Japan, the battery banks were sized to last for eight hours. In U.S. plants, most of our reactors are designed for four hours, so the chances of our reactors surviving better with half the capacity is probably slim. At some point during the accident, the batteries were depleted, giving the plant its third strike, and they weren't bowling, so it wasn't ten strikes they're going for. It was more like baseball. They, they were out. This is a chart from an NRC study done years and years before Fukushima that shows what happens when you lose normal power supply, the backup power supply, and the batteries. And Fukushima was very courteous in following the timeline that had been established years and years ago. The green dotted line vertical is four hours. That's what U.S. plants have battery capacity for. The, eight, the red dotted red line is eight hours. At about five or six hours on this analysis, the batteries were gone. At that point, the, the water level started dropping. The core started heating up. At about 14 hours, 10 to 12 hours, the reactor core had melted, burned through the reactor vessel. A prediction, not a, not a surprise. And a few hours after that, the containment failed. So you have everything bad that can go wrong, was predicted to go wrong many, many years ago. Fukushima showed it three times that this analysis worked. The result, unit three is on the left, unit four is on the right. Doesn't really matter, you could swap them. It's not pretty either way. The building exploded. There wasn't even any, there may not have been any fuel in the unit four spent, or unit four core, but it blew up as well. Sympathy pains or something. So the Reactor buildings are secondary containment, the last barrier between nasty radioactive stuff and the public, meaning there are no barriers left at Fukushima. This, is, this isn't my study, it's not Arnie's study, it's not Ralph Nader's study, it's not Helen Caldicott's study, it's the NRC study from August of 2003. They looked at what would happen at U.S. plants if there was an extended power outage. The NRC, not us. This is the table for pressurized water reactors like Seabrook. The third column over shows the chance of core meltdown due to an extended power outage. The second column shows the overall risk of meltdown for that, that reactor that's calculated by the plant's owner. Again, not me, not Arnie, not Greenpeace or anybody else. And the fourth column is simply the fraction. What percentage of the overall chance of meltdown does station blackout represent? For many plants in the United States, it's a very large chance of meltdown 